Hey Siri, how to adjust headlights for a 150 Prado shopping trolley? Okay, I found this on the web for how to adjust headlights for 150 Prado shopping trolley. <laughs> It's on the internet, it's gotta be true. This is a shopping trolley. <laughs>
one of you in the convoy must have one. Oh, and don't forget to carry extra 10 mil sockets. Coming up to a bend tools, I'm turning left at the windmill, left. Copy that, back. Hey, Ronnie, are you picking up Chris? I get crackles coming through on here, but I can't hear anything. Ah, uh, no, I've barely got you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Is that you, Chris? Yeah, sure. Come again? Yeah, come on, yeah, yeah, what's up? Uh, no, just checking, I didn't take a wrong turn. Well, where are you? You continued straight on. Yeah, that was the last intersection. No, no, no. You gotta turn left. Turn left. Just stopped for lunch at an intersection. And there's a reason for me stopping at this intersection. It's a good spot where I've got to wait for everyone else anyway, because I need to mark that turn. If I do not mark that turn, people could go the wrong way. And when you're out in the outback, going the wrong way can result in dire consequences. It can go really bad, really quick. Say for instance, the vehicles turn left. The third vehicle, which is the last vehicle, goes straight on. That person could go for a very long time before they realize they've actually, in fact, gone the wrong way. So when you are not sure which way to go and you're at the back, there's a few things you need to do, which we'll jump to very soon. But to prevent this from the very get-go is to make sure you've got communication. But even better, if you get to a turn, mark it. Now I know out here the dust can get pretty bad and you want a distance between the other vehicles but you're better off copying a little bit of dust every now and then just to make sure you get the right turns because if you don't things can end up real bad. The tyre marks on the ground clearly indicate that people have turned left but there is a couple that go straight on so you can never be too sure. So if you do continue on straight and all of a sudden you realize you've gone the wrong way the best thing to do is actually come back to the last intersection and wait there and if your mates are really your mates they will probably come back always wait at the last intersection and eventually you'll all meet up again and that's the safest thing to do but in saying all that we always run the practice of when you get to an intersection the car stops once you can see the vehicle behind coming along you can carry on and they'll do the same. If they're the last car, they'll make the turn and call through and say, Taylor and Charlie has taken the turn and everybody knows you're all on the correct path and safe. Oh, and one last thing. The reason why Ronnie is always up front is because we're trying to ditch him. Something that's very obvious for people traveling the outback is the gate rule. But, you know, we have backpackers and other people who don't have outback experience for traveling. It's very different to a lot of other things, as we've already discussed. The gate rule, you come to a gate, you must always leave the gate how it is. This gate was shut, so once we pass it, we will shut it again. And there's many reasons for that. This one here in particular is a dog proof fence, there's a few telltale signs, but most of the time it's just other gates like rabbit proof fences, there's also cattle gates, sheep gates, just general stock on a station gates. So if, if the gate's open, leave it open. If the gate is closed, you've got to close it after you pass it. And that's just the rules. It's a pretty simple one.
things have gotten a little bit tight here. That's what happens when you take the, the tracks less traveled. So keep that in mind, guys. Check that out. All right, we need to do a bit of a pruning. Now this is, this has been going on for a while, but this is probably the worst section so far. Now just work a couple of minutes here so I can actually open the door now, almost. Got to remove a few more bushes and then we'll keep moving. I don't think anyone's been on this track for a little while. What you see here is a young boy imitating to be a man. Where he has gone wrong is he is not in Japanese safety boots and a tank top. Plus, he's wearing protection. What the hell? So should we put this in as a tip here? If you're gonna take the tracks that are less frequently traveled, even on station country, in the outback, definitely bring a chainsaw. Because I've done this before, well we've done this before without a chainsaw. And it's not a lot of fun, is it? Yep. Machetes only go so far. And axes. And axes. Yeah. You end up not chopping as much as you should, and you just scratch your cap car. It does help having this though. We're a fair way in now on this tight track. Here's another tip and a bit of advice for you. If you do get stuck out here and you don't have any, you know, means of contacting the outside world and you need some water, you're out of water, what do you do? A place like this is an old creek. So you can actually follow this down a bit and you'll be surprised, it may look dry and barren even on a stinking hot day, but you will sometimes find a little pocket of water, which you can take out and you gotta boil it though, because it'll be pretty festy out here. Also, you can track it by seeing where the birds fly to. So let's go over and I'll, I'll show you. Now, especially in WA, there's a lot of X stations out here that are sort of, you know, they're no longer run. But there's a lot of balls out here that, that are still in operation. So if you're going through this kind of country, or even if you're on, a, on an active station, I mean, they're so big that you can go to a borehole or a windmill and get some water there as well. And I have done that a few times in the past. Here's our first little pool here. Now, if you do have to drink this kind of stuff, you gotta start a fire, you gotta boil some water because this will probably kill you. There'll be heaps of mozzie larvae and all kinds of you know, bacteria in there. Let's go check out the bigger one. Nice. That's a good find, actually. Nice little water hole. It's actually shaped like a bow tie. 
<laughs> Little pocket up there too. too. Oh, another good. pocket over there. There's heaps here. Yeah, there's quite a few here. Saw a few birds landing here drinking, so must be the only source of water around here. What do you got in your hand? A bit of, I found a piece of iron ore and some quartz, and one of the quartz has actually got copper oh, stuff copper. on it. Yeah. Hence the mines. Actually, there's a copper mine here. Well, that will be go. copper. All right, let's keep going, man. Yep. Let's talk light colour. Well, there's the difference between my headlights and my front spotlights. My lights are around the 4,500 to 5,000 Kelvins, which in my opinion is the best colour because it's the closest to natural sunlight. Anything higher than that, it becomes too stark and can play tricks on your eyes and actually make your eyes very tired. So that's the colour I run and I find them very effective. They do pretty good in the bush. Well last night was an interesting night to say the least. We didn't get to camp till 10.30 because we were actually lost. We just couldn't get out of the area that we're in. So this morning we are now looking back of the maps and I thought I'd bring up another tip right here and that is mapping. A lot of people tend to have GPS mapping but don't have paper mapping and vice versa. So which is better? Paper maps are more reliable if you know how to read them and even if you don't really know how to read a paper map at least you can find uh, landmarks and stuff and you can work out where you are if you get lost. GPS's are better for getting in and out of places but if your technology fails then you're kind of stuffed because then you've got no maps and therefore it's best to have both. And if I could only have one, I would go with a paper map because if this fails, and I've been in a situation before where I had a map that failed, a GPS, I had to go back to the paper map. And if I didn't have the paper map, I could have been in a bit of trouble. So when it comes to mapping, especially out in the outback, you don't want to get lost out here because if you do, and you end up on the wrong track, you could be driving for hundreds of kilometers before you realize that you're in fact going the wrong way. So eventually you will run out of fuel, and then the next thing you'll run out of is water and then food. That's where the satellite phone comes back in handy. So get your mapping right, know where you're going before you go anywhere. Even if it's a tourist map, they can actually be quite helpful because there's still landmarks on it, and these maps are free. Sure, you can buy these maps as well, and these are the ones that I recommend that you have in your vehicle. Hey Torps, what would you say is the most important thing about convoy driving? What is the most important kit for convoy driving? Most important kit for convoy driving? <laughs> exactly what we're talking on. Communication, in my opinion. That's how obvious it is. A good radio with good signal, and an antenna place in an ideal place. Mine's on the roof, you can have them on the bull bar, you can have them in all kinds of places. There are a few different benefits. Having it on the bull bar, you can actually brush away branches, you can gauge your height when you're going through things. Having it on the roof, you catch more trees, but you also have superior um, coverage and uh, superior broadcasting, I should say. You get a better signal on the roof, there's no doubt about it. Also, think about convoy placement. If someone's got all their antennas on the front and they're at the back of the convoy, it's gonna kinda of work because they're casting forward and they're receiving from the front. Whereas someone has the antenna right in the back of the vehicle, well, if you've got a big distance on a uh, dusty road, they may not be able to reach as well with that antenna. However, if you're in front of the convoy, it's a whole different story. So there's a couple of things you need to factor in there if you need to um, be up very far apart because of the dust. Now dust out here can get pretty bad. Sometimes it just hangs around 
there's no wind sometimes. When that's the case, it can hang there for a long time and then your convoy could actually be almost two kilometer gaps sometimes. So if you've got a convoy of five vehicles or 10 vehicles, you can pretty much do the math there. When checking out old relics like this shoeing shed here, it's really bloody awesome. Obviously, you know, be aware of if it's going to collapse or not. But it's more about the snakes, actually. You can see, I always wear closed shoes and pants because this is a snake haven. And you get nailed by a snake out here, you're pretty well cactus. This is what's called a clamp snake. They're pretty dangerous. Yeah, I, I'll sort it. Oi! In all seriousness, most people get nailed by a snake either by a complete accident, a step on one, or they'll try and pick one up. So don't be an idiot and try and pick up a snake. Like yeah, like what? Yeah, the, the clamp snake. <laughs> the clamp snake. <laughs> most snakes in Australia, in fact, only have four millimeter fangs, so they can't get through your clothing. In Australia, as long as you're wearing shoes and pants, nothing can really happen unless you try and pick something up. And this is what I'm talking about right here, a snake bite kit. But they're only good to you if you actually know how to use them. And preventative is the best measure, like I just explained. What a big good idea to talk about fuel out here. What do I carry when I go remote traveling like this? I carry 150 liters. I've actually upgraded the tank on the Hilux. If you want to know more about that, there's a whole episode on that part of the vehicle. But what I mainly want to talk about here, it doesn't matter how much fuel you can carry, you should always carry an extra container, even if it's just 20 liters. And here's the reason why. If you're out here and you get to that service station, they may not have petrol, they may not have diesel. Uh, they may be shut, depending on, you know, what time you get there and what time of the seasons and all kinds of things. A lot of things can, can depend on a lot of variables. So 20 litres is what I recommend as extra fuel because that can give most people at least another 100 k's to get somewhere, just in case. And plus the anxiety level is going to be a lot less. I carry... Well, I can carry 50, but I generally just put about 35 in. It's just so I know I've got that little bit extra just to get me somewhere so I can fill up. One thing we haven't covered yet, which is very important actually, most people who travel outback roads like this don't lower the tires. And look, you can get away with it. It's actually fine. But if you want a more comfortable ride, take some air out of your tires. For example, on the Luxie, I'm down to 28 PSI, normally on 40. The trailer is in fact down to 20 PSI. The Prado here, I believe that's down to about 28 as well. And then we got Torbs of 79. What are you down to? 28. 28 PSI pretty much all round, all cars. This gives us a much more comfortable ride. It's an all round tire pressure corrugations, smoother ride on the road, we can still go fast, like we tend to not go over 90 to 100 because at about 28 psi you're going towards the, the sort of lower setting that you should be a little bit careful with. Uh, but other than that, like we haven't had to touch our tyres since we've done that. Of course, if we get to the highway and we're going to travel more than 50 k's, then we will pump them back up to highway pressure. But that's the only time. Most of this is gravel roads, corrugations, uh, rocky offshoots, finding camp in the dark down some tight tracks, you know, 28 psi is pretty damn good. Samphire. So across this salt lake, I just spotted all the samphires everywhere here actually. 
Yeah, try this. It's really good. Oh, yeah. Really tasty succulents. This would go really well with our Outback lunch. Now, you will not believe what we got for lunch. So we'll harvest some of this. Has this turned into a cooking show all of a sudden? Try and guess what we're having. You won't guess it. Outback something rather with samphire salad, I reckon. So the young shoots are the best. So we just got to find a few more of them. And you know how I know it's safe? Because we got Torbs to try first anyway. Where's Torbs? When it comes to passing other people on dusty roads, now most people who travel the Outback, they will know it gets pretty dusty and visibility is pretty low as you pass someone so it's always a good idea for safety reasons just to slow down but also courteous less rocks and dust flicked up the old person you'll find that most truckies do the right thing out here they will actually slow right down and sit right over in the other side well right over on their side of the road and that's what i suggest that anyone else does as well sit slow down sit right as far as you can to your side of the track or the road and less dust and stuff is going to be kicked up between us And the basis of this tip and advice is you don't have to eat boring food whilst out in the bush. Of course, if you just want something nice and easy, sausages, go for it. But after a while, you're going to want to try some new things. This is pretty easy. If you want to see how to cook these, head over to the second channel. Oh, ho, look at that. Western craze. Outback craze. Or rock lobster. Traveling the outback, you obviously go camping as well. We're lucky enough to be in a campsite that is not going to see anyone else apart from us and the cameraman. That's killer, isn't it? It is wicked. So, when you do head out on a trip and you're traveling on your own, you're leaving a family behind, and if you have a camper trailer at home, just bring it. Like, don't feel you need to have the whole family to bring your camper trailer. You've got it at home, it's collecting dust anyway, Let's take it out and use it. Killer tip, bring extra warm clothes and blankets because out back, it can be hot during the day and damn, it drops at night. It gets cold. So that little bit of extra room, trust me, you'll thank yourself when you wake up in the morning. For sure, you can even just put it underneath all your stuff in the back seat. Yep, that's It's right. a blanket, oh. just bring it. You yep. won't regret it. That's right. Campfires, because you're camping. You're in the outback. Providing there's no fire ban, and the outback's pretty, pretty good with that. It's less fire bans out here than there are most places, but they yep. do come in. When you collect your firewood, don't knock down trees that are standing, because out here they are absolutely beautiful. That's half the reason why we come out here. We see these dead trees amongst all the other stuff. Oh, not just that, the birds are nesting in them. Yeah, that too. Budgies. Yep. Galars, whatever. Yep. So if you're going to use firewood, pick up the stuff that's on the ground. There is so much around. You don't even need a chainsaw unless you need to clear a track that hasn't been used for a long time. Uh, yeah, for sure. Woo! I'm glad we don't have smeller cam because she's getting warm out here in the outback. And that's why I'm sitting over here because it's getting a bit stinky over there. You know what? When you're out in the outback, you can actually throw a bucket of water in a fire, providing you're not tipping the water onto the fire. You can heat your water, have a bit of a cloth bath. You can even have your 12 volt shower. If it works, that is. Mine didn't work yesterday. But anyway, I'm nice and fresh and clean. And on that note, see you next time. And if you want more of this kind of content, let us know down below.